Hello, all. Welcome to the Chicago Justice Podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Siska. I'm also Executive Director of the Chicago Justice Project. You can get more about what we do every day at chicagojustice.org. If you're listening through the podcast, please hit subscribe. And if you're on YouTube, smash the subscribe and like, please. We'd really appreciate it. If you want to get involved in our work, cjpnation.org. You can also support our work at Patreon. Um, extras from the podcast will be being posted there. Also, behind the scenes strategy and all our transparency work. We just posted an our latest update yesterday, which was Tuesday the 26th. I'm recording on Wednesday the 27th. So we just posted that one. It's basically almost 15 minutes about our work on gang affiliation data. So, and what's going on in behind the scenes there with something called the high intensity drug trafficking areas and how they're working as, I think, more or less working as a shell company. Okay. So today's show, we feature an interview with the new Inspector General Deborah Witzberg, for those who've been listening to the pod or watching our live show or catching stuff on YouTube, Deborah has been a guest on the pod and our live show three or four times. She left the office of Deputy Public Safety Inspector General late last year, or I think late in the fall of last year, to pursue the position of Inspector General. And after the agonizing time it took the mayor's office and to get everything going, they came out with hiring Deborah as the Inspector General. We talked to her today about a variety of things. We sit, um, we discussed the most recent report from her old office, the Deputy Public Safety Inspector General, on the police accountability system and how they really don't have any policies that um, that make the discipline they hand out consistent, or whether or not they find someone guilty consistent across cases. So you try to do that as best you can. Nothing's going to be 100% because the facts of each individual case play out, but you want some consistency. Um, one off of another, similar conduct, you want consistency in what happens to them. Okay. We also talk about an aspir aspirational plan the office put out in our absence, but I'm sure she basically wrote that towards the end of last year, which is a bunch of reports um, that they're hoping to get done in 22 and some in, uh, going on to the future. They won't all get done because they get stuff that come up that they've got to do. But we talked about some of them because many of them are really, really important and we really hope they get done. And then towards the end of the interview, we talk about staying in her lane. Um, you'll find out more about what that is about towards the, uh, towards the end of the podcast. It's pretty funny and scary at the same time. So I'll be back after the interview. Deborah Witzberg, the new Inspector General for the City of Chicago, thank you so much for jumping on with us. Thanks for having me. For those who don't know, Deborah is reasonably fresh into her job after being the Deputy Public Safety Inspector General and at least the first one in that office to really um, do what I was hoping that office would do. Um, I helped create it back in the day, so I'm very happy about that. All right, Deborah, we are going to start off talking about the fairness and consistency in the disciplinary process for the Chicago Police Department members. A report recently released by your office, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I want to talk about a couple of findings. Anyone who's looked into um, the police accountability system in Chicago, it is really a mess of like overlapping responsibilities and organizations and people, whenever there's a bad incident that the system seems to have missed or not responded to fairly. People just want to create another agency, one on top of the other. It's, Chicago's is probably one of the most complicated, if not in the country. Um, unfortunately, that complicatedness does not lead to consistency or effectiveness, um, despite whatever the, may or, what, uh, the mayoral wannabes and city council today said as they tried to file uh, an ordinance to disband the Citizen Office of Police Accountability. If I got that name right, they tried to file an ordinance to get rid of COPA. Welcome to Chicago. Okay, so here's one of the findings. OIG found that existing BIA, COPA, and police board policies do not provide clear and actionable guidance to agency personnel sufficiently to ensure procedural consistency and fairness in the determination of discipline across misconduct investigations. Okay, so I hear that and I say, 
they just kind of make it up on, on their own? Is, is that what I'm hearing? What, what's the details there? So uh, let's let's go back a little bit in, yeah. in terms of the, the direction and the orientation of that project. One of the ongoing ordinance-based mandates of our public safety section is to review sustained discipline and disciplinary penalties assigned to CPD members for consistency and fairness. That, that's, that's, what, that's how the obligation reads. And unlike some of our projects, which are sort of a, a one-time self-contained inquiry, this is an ongoing obligation that we have over time. And so the approach that we, we've taken kind of an iterative approach where we, have, we are looking at different pieces of this larger consistency and fairness question as we go. I also should say this is against the backdrop of my general view that the sort of transparency and robustness of the police disciplinary system is as central as anything. It is as close to the heartland as anything in the endeavor to improve the relationship between the police department and the communities it serves. I think a well-functioning disciplinary system, and you and I have talked about this before, in which both members of the public and members of the department have reason to be confident is an absolute necessity to, to meaningful reform. So against that backdrop, um, we've done a couple of things to kind of start to get at this question of consistency and fairness. The first thing that we did predating this report is I think really a reflection of what you of exactly what you said about the sort of staggering complexity of Chicago's police disciplinary system for lots of reasons, including exactly the one that you identify about kind of crisis response. Um, the disciplinary system here in Chicago is Byzantine. It is so complicated as to threaten to collapse on itself. And there is, I think, a, a threshold kind of common sense driven question to be asked about whether something that complicated can possibly be fair just by virtue of how complicated it is. Our first installment in this work was a process map where we laid out all of the various uh, estuaries of the police <laughs> disciplinary system and what they looked like and how they pieced together. That's available on our website. That's a living and updating resource, which is designed really as a reference for members of the public and members of the department as we think about navigating this disciplinary system. This report, that, that we're talking about today is the second installment of this work. And here we are looking at procedural consistency and fairness. So we are not looking at outcomes of the disciplinary process, but rather the question of whether the process by which disciplinary recommendations are reached and reviewed is fair to CPD members. And, and our overarching conclusion exactly as you say is that is that it isn't, it is not, there is not adequate consistency or fairness across disciplinary investigations. Now, the reason I think it's important to make this process versus outcomes distinction is that the outcome of each disciplinary investigation should be specific to the facts and the circumstances of that incident and, and, and appropriately tailored to the people involved. The processes, however, by which those decisions are reached should be consistent and fair. And so what we're getting at in the finding that you just read is this question of whether the agencies at, at, at work here, and that is primarily COPA, the Bureau of Internal Affairs and the Police Board, whether those agencies are equipping their members with actionable guidance to channel their discretion in a way that is consistent and fair. Right. And, and that's very important. I mean, I know people think people may look at that and read it as kind of like um, what journalists would say is that's um, um, internal baseball. The people don't care about that. And that's a big problem. Now, in a world where we weren't the police and many, many police officers weren't are we're not so steadfast in their belief that everything that the accountability system does is wrong. And where communities were not so steadfast in their belief that everything they do is wrong unless the cop is fired, this would be exceedingly important. Because one of the things I've always said, and I was, um, I helped the police accountability, um, the Coalition for Police Accountability draft the reforms to the police board. We drafted in 109 and Daly didn't pass it and Rom did in late uh, September of 2011. And I said, uh, like, we got pushback from the police union. I said, I don't understand. All we're asking for is transparency. That should be something you want. You should want the transcripts put up where your 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 your, um, your officers can see what's going on, so they can have faith in the process. 
Um, and they, they were obviously they were totally against it, but this should be in a, in a city that cares about this, this should be a vital piece of it. That's, right. ab that's absolutely right. It, we, we cannot have a police disciplinary system that operates in a windowless room. That, oper that is to everybody's detriment. Um, and I think, you know, I, 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 agree, I agree with all that. I, I think ev everybody involved is well served by a fair, by a fair system. Right. And, you know, when uh, I forgot the officers named out, it was back in around 2000. Oh, no, we did the study in nine. So it was before nine. Um, he got, a, he got, um, there was a complaint about, it was on video of him beating a black elderly gentleman in a, in a hospital. He cuffed his arms and legs and the guy was drunk and he beat the, beat the guy in uniform in front of a bunch of people. And when he got suspended pending the police board action about his termination, he told everyone he knew in the, in the department, don't worry, I've got an alderman. He reached out to the police board. I'm not getting fired. He got suspended for five years, but not fired. And it was throughout the entirety of the department. Everyone had heard about the fact that that had happened. And the reality is when you don't have transparency, things like that can happen. Um, and they should have to explain their decisions. They should have to show um, the officers and the civilians that make the complaints. They're due investigators and board members of the police board that are doing their due diligence and putting everything into these cases. Um, I, yeah, I, I think I think that's right. I think they are owed that and that amount of transparency. I think um, this is an area where the city has not earned the benefit of anybody's doubt. The way that police discipline and police accountability has worked in Chicago for decades um, doesn't doesn't deserve the benefit of the doubt. And, and where there are things happening in windowless rooms, there's an awful lot of room for people to assume the worst case scenario. And I think, you know, this is one of those, this is one of those places. Right. In your report, you were on our, our live show in the last couple of years, the report about um, when police grieve their discipline, they go through the grievance process 75% of the time, it gets reduced or eliminated. Whoa, that can't happen. All right. Or at least people should know about it if it is. And honestly, if that is the case, because they're actually not guilty or something, then that's got to flow back into why are so many people, why are so many of those officers being found guilty and this discipline putting, being placed on them, that then the system is broken and we need to fix it because we need everyone to believe in it. Okay. So there's one more I want to talk about of this report. Um, basically, it, it basically just, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it deals with the inability or to have consistency about aggravating and mitigating factors. And that's something that's always bothered me, especially with police board decisions. At one point, does one bad incident raise to a bar that it outweighs 10 or 15 or 20 years of great behavior, right? And I, I've always viewed this at as a reformer, it's like, wait a minute, we don't say someone who murdered someone or did a serious crime, the judge doesn't go, so, oh, you know, you for the last 30 years, you've been really good. This is only one bad time. Okay, we'll only give you, you know, a year, a slap on the wrist. That one bad thing is enough. And I've always argued, we've never been able to have clarity about what that is and how much of a role it plays. And, and, it, and to my thinking, if it raises to a certain level, it shouldn't make a difference how many cops come in and say this guy's great if he did the event. They should just be dinged for it. Yeah, I, I think what, what you're getting at is that, or, or, um, or at least what that sort of calls to mind for me is the observation that every, every disciplinary investigation, every incident of misconduct, when we're thinking about penalties, um, we need to be considering both the event at issue, the act at issue, as well as the history of the accused member, for better or for worse. I mean, both of those things are relevant. What happened and who was involved? We need to be account sort of considering both of those things. I think it's, it is not a perfect analogy, but this for me, it, as a former prosecutor, I have thought a lot about the analogy to criminal sentencing and the way that you know, you necessarily account both for the crime of which someone has been convicted and their criminal history. Both of those things feed into the determination of an appropriate sentence. And I think there is, albeit imperfect, there is an analogy here. Um, and I think, you know, there, there are lots of challenging situations. 
among the most challenging are probably the example that you give where the misconduct issue is very, very serious, but someone has a very positive history. Or on the other end of the spectrum, if someone has a very problematic history, but the misconduct issue is relatively minor, also challenging in terms of assigning appropriate penalties, right? At both ends of that spectrum and everywhere in between, everybody involved here is entitled to some measure of predictability and fairness in, in which factors are being considered in determining the penalty. Right, and the police should know like the predictability, they should, the police office, the members of the police department should know that the facts around white people are getting dinged and should know, hey, you do this, you're, you may, you're probably going to lose your job. Not because of politics, not because that your boss doesn't like you, whatever the, those reasons that everyone thinks interfere and may very well interfere to some degree, unfortunately. Um, they need to know that. And um, I, I think people... I think people in Chicago, because we're a lot of the reformers were so centralized on just getting things better on the street for people of color. And I, I get that. But I also think we fail to understand how much the police department, for better or worse, at times, this does a disservice to their good members. Um, by just putting out fires or not caring, that's a problem. And I, I think that we, is absolutely right. That the, the, the police department is doing its members a tremendous disservice in, in this regard and in some others. And I've always thought that, but it was never, and I think we've talked about this before on the live show, I was never more clear to me when I went to meet a friend of mine who's on the job and he brought another one of his friends. I'm like, oh God, they're not going to like what I do. Here I go, I'm going to get lectured again. And he's like, no, 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 you can talk to him. So I was talking to him, like, what do you do? He goes, I file paper. I'm like, what? He goes, I file paper. He goes, Tracy, this department is so bad. Our bosses are so bad. I can't go ask someone how to do things they don't know. My boss is a cloud promotion whose boss is a cloud promotion who's another cloud promotion. They don't know what to do. I'd rather file paperwork. I'm not going to risk my life on streets for these guys. And that was like a, 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 another reinforcement to me, at least, about how, wow, that guy, I don't know his history, but he seemed like a good person and would be a good cop. And he doesn't want to, he's scared of being that and that. That a little bit was like the fact that he was just willing to sit and file paperwork for the next seven years until he retired um, was scary. Okay, I want to talk about this outlook on police oversight and accountability. And I think it published um, during your time of unemployment between you being the Deputy Public Safety Inspector General and you getting this um, glorious position as the Inspector General for the city. But I do want to talk about this because I do want people to understand um, the goals, but the vision of what the Deputy Public Safety Inspector General, what that section of your office is going to do, because I think it's very important people to understand that. I don't think your office and the work it does gets enough play in the press for those, um, especially the results. I think that is, when I helped create the office, I wanted it to have a much, I was hoping it would have a much stronger role in the public debate around things. But in all this debate about the cops and policing and everything, it just never, the results don't seem to get where I wish I was hope they would be. Um, and I think your work gets underplayed and that's a shame. So we're going to change. We're going to try to change that. Okay. So I'm just, what I want to do is I'm going to go over some of these. Um, these are for our audience. A lot of these are basically aspirational and whether or not they're going to be taken up in a month or three years, maybe, but I kind of want to talk about why they're on this list. And now I don't want to go into great detail in any of them, but just like a minute or two or three on several of them about why they made this list and why they're important to be on the list. Yeah. I, before we get there, if we could just very briefly talk about the nature of this Outlook document that you're referring yeah. to. And, and I will say two things about that. One is that it, it is sort of a, a menu of potential project topics, as you say. These are things that we are kind of on our radar in terms of areas of, of potential and priority focus. And we, we will do some of them, we won't do all of them, and we'll do some projects that don't appear on this list. This is just a, a mechanism for us to sort of communicate publicly and to gather feedback about the kinds of things that are important for us to look at. That document, the outlook, is organized into what are our long running kind of areas of priority focus in terms of categories of topics. And so those are at a high level, 
the, the operational and administrative competence of the police department, the robustness and transparency of the disciplinary system, and constitutional policing. And so those are these three areas of, of strategic focus and priority into which our various potential project topics fit. And so I just wanted to yeah. preface the conversation, uh, any conversation about specific topics with that general kind of view of the of what that exercise and that document is about. Okay, and a lot of these, and um, ladies and gentlemen, the reason I'm bringing these up, these are totally my choice, but they're what I view as being important. Um, and my dog Pepper, if you've not heard her bark, she seems to love barking on my podcast review um, records now. Okay, the first one is operations of C C D C J uh, C J P C P D's education and training division. So why I know that if I believe right, they just got a kick right because they're building that new academy. So they just that's part of the C P D budget increase. Much of the driver for this topic really has to do with the observation that. Um, new policies are only as good as their implementation and they're only as good as the training on them. And so in an era of policy reform, I, I, I don't know that I would say rapid policy reform, but in an era of policy reform driven in part, but not entirely by the consent decree, um, you know, I think it's important to think about how we are training officers on new policies that are put into place. So that's one piece of this. The other piece is the sort of common sense driven observation that the academy, the education training division is, is the first stop on the train when people join the department. That is our opportunity to shape the department as we want it to be. And so it's, it's critically important to how the department operates. Okay, and this one is really um, close to my heart because when the Office of Professional Standards got changed into Independent Police Review Authority. N not too far away from the original head's uh, departure, who was Alana Rosenzweig, we would, the coalition that I was part of would meet with her every six months. She talked about mediating a, starting to mediate some disciplinary cases, cases in which at least at that point, um, it seemed from an, um, you know, initial investigation that this officer was going to be found guilty of it pretty quickly. And could they um, mediate the discipline, like reduce the discipline, get the person to admit it, reduce the discipline, but uh, put a put it on his record. So if he did anything like that, again, he would be terminated. That's how it was explained to us at the time. We never saw any paper or regulations about this. And what bothered me the most about this is that during this time, she brought up a domestic violence incident where this guy had beaten up his wife and hit another person in a different jurisdiction and was arrested. And she mediated that incident. And that blew us up because we were assured mediation was only gonna be used for uh, low level nonviolent stuff. So uh, I know on this list of, is looking at the mediation process for misconduct complaints. So with that context of me just blurting all that out, why is this? Why is this on your uh, your horizon here? Um, for a couple of reasons. Among them, some observations in line with the ones that you are making, which is that this is a way that some disciplinary cases are getting and will get resolved. This is another sort of imperfect analogy, but this is like a plea bargain, right? This is this is a way that that some allegations get resolved, and we want to account for that in taking a kind of holistic view of the disciplinary system. This is also a consent decree mandated topic for the public safety section to cover. So there are a handful of specific subjects which the public safety section is required by the terms of the consent decree to examine. This is one of them. Um, and so this work is underway. And roughly what we are looking to get at here, again, implicates some of, some of your observations here. We want to look at what controls are in place around what is eligible for mediation, what sorts of outcomes those mediations have, where there are and aren't opportunities for complainants to be involved in mediation, um, all of those sort of surrounding questions. Okay, we're going to move on to another one of these topics that's interesting to me that I remember I was giving a talk at a local university and I'll kind of protect the, the officer and um, 
he he spoke first and then he stayed for me and then I spoke and uh oddly enough we got along and I I because I brought up the whole m4 issue this is about the time they had been they had uh, brought them into the city and I was highly skeptical about that I was really worried about the misuse and then being fired in the right situation but having bad outcomes and he brought up stories to me he was an ex-sniper in the military and he brought up countless. he goes I, I go and shoot every month to stay stay um active and he said he goes Tracy I can't tell you how many times I go into the academy and I see trainers helping holding the gun and helping hold the gun for people so they can qualify with the assault rifle. And he's like, that's not how it should happen. He goes, when I trained in the military for sniper, I got one chance to qualify. And if you fail, you're out. That's it. So with that, I mean, so that was like, wow, that really shocked me. So why did this def um, deficiencies in weapons qualifications, why did this come on your radar? Or why is it of interest to, to the office? This is a safety. This is a life and safety issue for members of the public and members of the department. Um, if, in fact, we are not doing a good enough job making sure that officers can use weapons safely, we are putting everybody involved at risk. That is true. Um, and I, I think the, the issuing of assault weapons to all cops I know everyone's bring is this is probably the bad time to bring this up, but all the mass shootings we're having in Chicago, let alone the you know Highland Park and everything. But um, I always think there was function creep. Like I'm always worried, and this plays into our next category here: is you bring um, you you let a specific um, technology or weapon be used for a very narrow purpose, and once you authorize that, it, it always creeps. the The purpose, the use, always expands. Right. It's like you can't ever open the bottle. Once you do a little bit, it always goes. Um, yeah, I think that that in my mind sort of feeds into a larger observation that we try to thread through a lot of the work that we do, which is that when making a decision about the use of any law enforcement tool, whatever that may be, whether that's a, a procedure or a weapon or a technology, whatever the case may be, when making a decision about whether to use a law enforcement tool we should be doing a well-informed cost-benefit analysis, whether the, the costs attendant to the use of a tool are outweighed by its operational law enforcement benefit. And I think, you know, the, the risk that you're raising with this crew should, should be one of the things that gets weighed there. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, originally, I don't think anyone would say, well, the SWAT team needs these weapons. And I brought up, I remember we met with the superintendent. I was like, if you need these weapons in each district, why don't you give each sergeant or, or one sergeant in each district a truck with the weapons so that if they can get to a situation? Because um, I was really worried they'd be, they'd be misused um, and used for intimidation. And there's plenty of, uh, um, what's the word? There's plenty of evidence um, that's not put into a study that or pl plenty of allegations that that is the case. But that has always worried me, is that the, the weapons should just be misused. And oddly enough, with, I should say with the, with the M4s, I actually didn't know about it. I got contacted by a high-level person in the department who asked for a meeting with me and handed me the, um, the draft general order and said, please stop this. And to quote him, he said, my guys on the street, not just guys, but guys and girls, he said, don't need another decision to make. They don't need this weapon. This is just another decision. They're going to, and he said, and I agree with him, he's going to, someone's going to use it in the right situation five years from now, but it's going to have a negative outcome, meaning the bullet goes two miles and kills someone in a house. And then that officer is going to get hung out to dry. They're, the people who approved this, which was Jody Weiss at the time, are not going to be around to defend this officer. So anyways, that's but it plays right into our next issue, inventory, next category, inventory use and impact of military grade equipment. Yeah, this, this I think is sort of the heartland of police community relations. So, um, you know, there are a number of cha channels through which the police department comes into possession of military grade equipment. Um, and it is of interest to us how those things get used and how decisions are made about, again, 
from a cost benefit perspective, whether the law enforcement benefits of using military equipment outweigh the sort of community relations legitimacy risks of rolling through neighborhoods and tanks and so on. Yeah, I, I always love the uh, social media videos from small towns about these big tank armored personnel carriers that their town got. Um, there's one in like Southern Michigan where the kids are like, oh my, two guys, young teenagers, oh my God, isn't that cool? And they're like, wait a minute, is our town that bad? We need a tank in it? So I always find those hilarious, but it is. People see it and, that, you know, let's be honest, this is Chicago, I can say this. You know, there are certain communities that are probably gonna see that tank more riding around their neighborhoods possibly than others. Um, unless there's some really outrageous incident in the Gold Coast, I doubt they're gonna see it unless it's like brought to the school and the kids get to go climb on it. Um, the last category here for this before we just get in the bigger picture of the office um, is the CPD's use of facial recognition technology. How did that get on the list? This is part of our continuing interest in technology tools used by the police department and surveillance technology more specifically. So, you know, I have this in some ways as uh, of a part with our work on ShotSpotter, looking at the, the ways in which we are using technologies and how we are measuring operational benefit as weighed against legitimacy and privacy risks. Everyone should go, you should go read everything this office has produced, but the ShotSpotter report was great. Um, and it really backed up a lot of what the activists are saying and the lack of having any external scientific evidence that it works um, is just very scary that we keep spending millions and millions on it. Okay, big picture for the office now that you're uh, the woman in charge here. What noticeable differences or changes are gonna be felt between your, um, your administration and Mr. Ferguson's administration? Well, look, I, we should all be so lucky as to, you know, be building on a foundation as strong as the one that this office stands on. Um, there are some things we're, we're going to do differently, uh, certainly. And I, uh, I think um, the, the, the biggest change that's underway is sort of a structural one having to do with how our intake function works, how we take in and process information that is coming to us. Um, you know, OIG's historical origins, our sort of origin story is as an investigative agency. Over time, over the life of the office, our operations have grown tremendously in breadth and complexity. And so we now really have three primary channels of oversight work. We have investigative work into allegations of criminal or administrative misconduct. We have program and policy work looking at you know, effectiveness and efficiency. That's all of our public safety work and our audit and program review work, et cetera. And then the third channel is data analysis and visualization presentation. And so as the operations of the office have grown in sophistication and complexity, our intake function has remained very much a creature of our investigative work. And it, 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 has, it has continued to be best suited to our to, to that first kind of investigative channel of work. And so what we are changing is to centralize our, the intake function within the office, make an independent intake unit kind of at the hub of the wheel of the office's operations so that we're better positioned when we get a piece of information from a member of the public or in, you know, any, from anyone, we can make the best decision about which of our oversight hammers is best suited for that nail. Sometimes that will be a disciplinary investigation and something, sometimes it will be something else. And so we are kind of truing up the way our intake function is structured to what the operations of the office really are. Okay, um, only got a couple more questions. If you had um, your wish and you could, or I mean, I guess what would be the top of your wish list for one power either the Deputy Public Safety Inspector General's specific section had or your office more generally could get it but doesn't currently have? I'm not sure this is exactly an answer to your question, but I think there is a reckoning coming with the, the public profile of our investigative work and the question of the circumstances under which OIG's investigative reports at some point become public and who makes that nomination. There, there are, I think, oh, yes. 
challenging and competing interests at work in that question, um, there's a reckoning coming there. And, and I think it, it's time to it's time to have that conversation. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure my audience is listening. Scott, aren't you independent of everything? Shouldn't it be the OIG that decides what goes public? And as a transparency person, um, I think everything should be public. Everything except like you have to protect identities where that needs to be done. Um, people who give you tips and all of that. And yes, but everything else should be public. Um, and it should not be at the whim of any political person in this city for any reason, because it will be, speaking of function creep, it will always, even if they're not doing it for the worst of reasons, the public is always just going to assume 100%. It's yeah. for the worst of reasons. So I th yeah, I, I think, I, yes, I, I, you know, I think there are confidentiality interests here. I think, again, to continue today's theme of imperfect analogies, when we think about investigative reporting about government, right, even, even and especially where government transparency is the object of the gain in that investigative reporting, we recognize the importance of the sanctity of secret sources, right? I mean, there, there, we recognize that there are sometimes needs for confidentiality in the service of transparency, however counterintuitive that is. And so I think there's there's that kind of general principle at work. There is also, however, the need to shine light on what is happening in city government. And as you refer to, the way that the ordin our ordinance is currently written is that the only mechanism by which OIG's investigative reports might be ever made public is under certain very limited circumstances when the city's corporation council decides to release that report. And I think that that is an arrangement which is overdue for some conversation. Undoubtedly. Okay, two questions left. And this one isn't specifically about your office, but it is a little bit. But um, a few weeks back, I had Dan Milahopoulos from WBZ on, on the show. And I've had Alderman Wagner's pack to talk about the same issue, which was the Park District sexual assault scandal. Can you explain to our to, to me and our listeners why independent but not really independent agencies like the Park District have their own OIG, Office of Inspector General, rather than it just going through your office and um, which has vastly more um, resources? And I would tend to bet, I, I don't know, but my assumption is at least more experienced investigators to handle things like this because the OIG's office did not handle things great. And then there was political interference where they fired the guy doing the investigation. Then they pushed out his boss, um, which would have been much harder to do if it was in your office, that investigation. So the current landscape, as you say, is that there are what are called sister agencies to the city, which have some amount of their own governing structure and authority and their own oversight functions. So the Chicago Park District at issue here has its own governing body, it has the, the board, and it has the, its own inspector general. Uh, Chicago Public Schools has, has its own IG, City Colleges has its own IG, um, and there are a handful of others. There are challenges and limitations built into that balkanized approach to oversight. Um, there has been periodically some discussion about consolidating those functions under a single umbrella in this office. That is not um, not a discussion that's been had recently. That, that has you know there has has been discussion of that in in years past. At a minimum, I think there are opportunities for cooperation and collaboration and resource and expertise sharing, which have probably gone unwise until now. That's that's an area of opportunity to say the least. Yeah, I, I saw that, and especially taught, I read everything Dan produced, and it was just so infuriating. That whole that whole situation is disgusting. But the idea that they could just fire the investigator that was handling an investigation of multiple sexual assaults internally um, was just um, super infuriating. And I know, um, at least with Joe and now with you, that is not something that is going to fly if there's people politically calling you to say, you got to fire this person. That just isn't happening. So, all right, now. Indeed, I will just add, add very yes. quickly. Um, 
agreed. But also, I will say, you know, one of the things that's worth keeping in mind about these other offices of Inspector General is that they are not all equipped with the same independence, the same structural independence mm -hmm. protections that we have. And that gives rise to exactly the sort of risk you've identified. Right. And unfortunately, for the Park District, it came at the expense of dozens, if not more, uh, women in their bodies. Um, and that's you would think it had been that alone would have been a clarion call for change, um, but it's Chicago, so we've just moved on. Um, so I have one last question for you. Can you clearly define for us what exactly your lane is and whether you're going to stay in that lane while you're in office here? Um, I, I think you refer there to the mayor's comments that she, you know, was looking for an inspector general who would stay in that lane. I, I um, look, OIG's statutory mandate is a really broad one. And it is my intention that we occupy every inch of it. I did not back down from difficult questions and topics as public safety deputy, and I won't as inspector general. Thank God. We kind of need it. We only have what? We have one alderman going to prison, one former alderman going to prison, a few under indictment, um, a few under investigation, including Garrido, currently by the FBI. So, I mean, it's not like it's not a target rich environment in the city council, unfortunately. Uh, Deborah Whitsburg, thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Okay, we are back. We'd like to once again, thanks Deborah. Thank Inspector General Deborah Whitsburg for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, very interesting discussion, no doubt about it. We really hope that they get to those reports as soon as possible. They're really vital. I'm very happy that I played the role I did in getting that office created. For those who don't know, the idea for bringing in uh, like an auditor type office into Chicago actually started with this guy right here. Um, and after two renditions of bringing people into the office that didn't really seem to fit, the third one really has made the office flourish. Um, the first one was a disaster. Um, but anyways, um, we hope they get to those reports um, very soon. And how about that staying in your lane? The mayor, we need an inspector general that stays in her lane. And the reason the mayor said that, ladies and gentlemen, is because the previous inspector general, whether you love Joe Ferguson or not, and that's who the previous inspector general was, he was definitely a force in the office, and the office, uh, for the most part, did the work it needed to be done. He cut a deal at some point with Rom to give Rom the ability to see reports before they went out, or I think that may have been when they, yeah, and so he cut a deal with Rom, which wasn't great to stay in office, and then Lightfoot changed the law that allows her to say what gets made public out of the Inspector General's report, which has to change, um, but the fact that it shows you how corrupt and morally bankrupt our politics is here, that the mayor would say publicly that she needs to stay in her lane. That is, um, that should have been grounds immediately for um, allowing a recall, getting the legislation for a recall vote, having that recall vote and getting her out of office within a matter of weeks. She should be gone just for saying that. Stay in your lane. Don't bother me. Don't bother me, whatever you do. Okay. Crazy. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, real quick, once again, support us on Patreon. You'll get insider stuff that you don't get anywhere else. Also, ladies and gentlemen, our 15th annual fundraiser is going. You can go to chicagojustice.org to donate. Look at any of our social media. The links are up there also. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for supporting. Once again, you're on YouTube. Smash your subscribe. If you're listening to the pod, please subscribe to the podcast. Really appreciate it. All of that helps us. And if you got any ideas for who you want on the pod as interviews or topics you want discussed or topics for policy pieces. We hope to either be posting later this week or early next week. We're going to start probably at least once a week, posting short policy pieces to the YouTube channel and the Facebook. Any of that, drop us a line at info, chicagojustice.org, or hit us up on any of our social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. All right. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. We'll be back next week.